And that's it. We are on the internet, just like that. Just like magic. Good morning. (laughs) How's it going? Good. How are you? Awesome. So I happy Monday, right? We are two days shy of 4th of July. Yes, we are. Which is in the middle of the week, which I was not happy about. It's kind of a weird spot. It is a weird spot. I agree. So um, I'm excited because I have known Dr. Andrea Burns for a long time. How long have I known you? Oh, my gosh. At least 10 years, right? It, at least it's, 10 years, for sure. I don't yeah, know, it's been it, a while. It may have been 10 years since I've seen you. Probably. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then how long we knew each other on top of that. Yes. Um, so you prefer Dr. Andrea or Dr. Burns? Because I saw both. Uh, either one is fine. Okay. Dr. Andrea is fine as well. <laughs> uh, Dr. Andrea is a pediatrician. She practices out of Orlando in a private practice. And she prides herself on her community involvement and her bedside manner and just being awesome in general. <laughs> and and you just transitioned to private practice, you said, right? I did, yes, a few months ago. It's been great. Nice. So what's the difference? Um, there are some pretty big differences, but basically you have your hospital-based systems where the hospital actually owns the practices in the area, specialty practices. And then you have your private practices, which are usually owned by physicians. Okay. Um, the practice that I'm at is actually owned by a physician for over 45 years. Oh, very cool. Yeah. So what is the, uh, the origin story of, uh, of Dr. Burns? Why did you decide to become a doctor? Well, my mom loves to tell the story, actually. <laughs> well, she's not um, here. So. She's not here. <laughs> so I would say for me, um, I've actually, I'm one of those people that actually knew they wanted to be a doctor since they were a child. Um, I actually made the decision around five years old to become a pediatrician or a kid doctor. And that's because my doctor, one of my doctors, Dr. Talbert, was such an amazing doctor. What I remember is he always talked to me whenever I was in the room, even as a young child. He asked me questions. He looked to me to answer questions about how I was doing. And that just made me feel really special as a child and as a person. And I always took that with me and wanted to give that to children as I got older. Um, And then I just naturally love children in general. Nice. And where did you go to school? I went to Florida A&M University for undergraduate in Tallahassee, Florida. And I went to the University of Florida. Go Gators. (laughs) (laughs) College of Medicine for medical school. Go Gators. (laughs) Uh, For anybody who doesn't know, in Florida, there is a steep, steep rivalry between the Florida teams. The FSU, the Gators, and UM. Mm -hmm. It's a a trifecta of of hate. Uh, (laughs) Pretty much. Yeah. (laughs) And if you're from Florida, you usually love football. <laughs> Most people, right? Yes. I've, I've never been a football person myself, but uh, some of the oh, guys, yeah, guys playing with balls never really cared. Um, <laughs> so what, uh, so how long ago did you finish? I actually um, graduated and became a doctor actually 10 years ago. Okay. Yeah. You know, you, you were still in school when we, when we met. So that, yeah. so there's, there's the yardstick. How about that? That's right. It's, it's been at least 10 years. <laughs> which is funny. Um, And did you immediately go into the hospital system? I did not. I actually did a few years in private practice before I transitioned into a hospital-based system. And then again, this year came out back into private practice, which is where I think I fit the best. Nice. And what's, um, since you've been doing it, what surprised you about the reality of doing it versus kind of what you expected beforehand? Oh, there's so many surprises. I mean, there's always something you're always learning. I mean, they call it the practice of medicine because you mm-hmm. literally are practicing, you know, you're, you're learning something every day. And I think one of the things that I value about it is just knowing that the parent, the mom, the father actually knows so much about their child and their advice to you or their, their information to you is very important. I mean, if, if you see a child and they look healthy, but the parent says something is wrong, probably something is wrong, you know, and heeding the advice of the parent is so important um, and working as a team. Um, And I just think for me, it's just a humbling experience because as a doctor, I'm privileged to go into people's private lives to hear things that they wouldn't tell anyone else. So just seeing how much people trust their position um, is an honor to me. And and I value that. Was there anything you expected about becoming a doctor that's turned out to be completely wrong? No, right. I don't think so. I mean, it's, it's a lot of work. I mean, it yeah. certainly is a lot of work and it's a lot of a time commitment, but um, I don't think you can honestly expect it until you're in it. 
So I think mm-hmm. for anyone, that it's probably a little bit of a surprise, but that when I get to actually participate in the patient care and see the kids, it's everything I would love it to be. Um, kids say the funniest things. <laughs> so it gives back every day. Do you have something funny that a kid said recently? Oh, my goodness. Oh. Let's see. I asked a kid where we, we ask about pain scale sometimes, a scale of one to ten. And when asking like about pain in the head or the throat, I'd say on a scale of one to ten, ten being the worst pain, one being no pain, where would you put the pain? And they'll give you a little pause and they say on my throat. <laughs> like, that's that's right. awesome. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> that, that is a correct answer. <laughs> that is a correct answer. Yeah. <laughs> They're just so innocent. <laughs> that's awesome. I mean, that's a, so do you go all the way to age 18? Basically 17. Typically 17. kids will transition out by the time they turn 18. I mean, that's a, that's a broad transition from 17 to zero. Yeah. Um, I almost feel like that should be two specialties, right? I mean, because that's, that's a really broad. Well, you actually do have some physicians that specialize in adolescent medicine for the teenagers. Okay. Um, but most pediatricians actually cover um, from newborn to about 17, 18. And for some of our um, more complex children, mm-hmm. we actually follow some of them up until the age of 21. Oh, wow. Um, yeah. I, I've known people who stuck with their pediatrician, you know, into their 20s. Um, mm-hmm. I don't think they were complex. I think they just decided they liked the doctor. <laughs> yeah, sometimes there's difficulty separating. Yeah. <laughs> we you love them, with- but we have to set them free. <laughs> <laughs> Eventually. Eventually, yes. <laughs> so do you prefer treating younger children or the adolescent age? Um, I love all ages, but I would have to say I have this debate with one of my colleagues. Six month old is actually my favorite age. They're just yeah. so happy and excited. They're not afraid. They don't have the stranger anxiety yet. They're just so cute and adorable. So that would probably be my favorite age to see. They can't talk much. They scream and, and yeah. coo and babble. <laughs> <laughs> I have parents ask me, why are they screaming? Like, because they can. Because <laughs> they found out they can. <laughs> right. And why not? You know. Exactly. <laughs> and they don't have many other ways to express themselves. Right. I mean. They don't. The options yeah. are limited. So screaming is kind of, yeah. you know. The only screaming thing or, or snatching something like hair. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> they have a limited tool set. They got to use what they got. You know? Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so are you familiar with the, the term uh, secondary drowning or dry drowning? I've heard that term, yes. Do you know anything about it? I do, yes. Would you tell me your thoughts on dry drowning or secondary drowning? So my understanding, I think it's a term that came up over time, which is really just a description of delayed symptoms of drowning, actually. Perfect. Um, So basically, you know, when a child is, so the definition of drowning itself is when a child is having some kind of a respiratory impairment or compromise because they've been submerged or immersed in large amounts of water, Mm -hmm. not even large amounts, but a good amount of water. Um, And they develop difficulty breathing, um, shortness of breath, you know, spasms, things like that, that can compromise the oxygen getting to their body. And sometimes they actually don't develop symptoms from the side effects of the tissue damage and things like that until later, usually in that first 24 hours after that's happened to them. And I think some people have started calling that dry drowning because they think it's something that happened later, but actually it's a process that started when the actual drowning occurred. Yeah. It's kind of a, a misnomer, right? Um, mm-hmm. and, and the media kind of latched onto it and you saw a lot about you know, dry drowning and then it was secondary drowning. Uh, yes. But really it's just drowning yeah. happening later on, which I think is important exactly. for people to realize. Before yes. people start freaking out about dry drowning, um, right. knowing that it's not really a thing is uh, is probably helpful, you know. Exactly. And it's not going to be three days from now that your child is having an issue. That would be exceedingly rare. Right. Typically, if we're, if we're worried about a child, we will watch them for about 24 hours. And if they're doing fine, then they're, they're probably going to be just fine. And there will be signs or an accident. You know, your kid's not going to be in the pool and then get out, be fine, and then drop dead of dry drowning 24 hours later. It's exactly. Not gonna happen. Exactly. So common signs can be they could be coughing. They might be short of breath. They may be gasping a little bit. They may be breathing fast. Chest discomfort. They may feel tired. Uh, they may be more irritable than usual. Um, trying to sleep. So these are, you know, these can be seen with other things. But if your child was previously doing well and then slowly you start seeing these things evolve, then you certainly want to seek medical attention right away. Absolutely. So since it is summer and 4th of July, what kind of things Mm -hmm. do you tell parents coming up for for summer? 
to keep them safe and happy and avoid any problems. Well, the big thing, because I mean, 4th of July certainly means swimming, especially sure. if you're over at the beach where I'm from. Yeah. Um, but it means, you know, lots of exposure to the sun at picnics while you're swimming, just spending time at the playgrounds. So it's really important to make sure that you cover sun safety. Um, so I really review, actually, I've been doing it for the last few months with parents, how to pick out sunscreens, how to apply those sunscreens um, and making sure that you don't get dehydrated while out there. So what should someone look for in a sunscreen? So basically, um, especially for children, so I'll kind of cover more mostly for children, but there's a few things you want to look at. You want to make sure that when you buy a sunblock or sunscreen that it's SPF um, 30 or higher. Okay. Um, the American Academy of Dermatology recommends 30 or higher, but recently actually on TV, I've seen some reports that say when they've actually tested these sunscreens, not all of them actually did what they said. Oh, wow. So what I've been recommending to my patients is actually go with the SPF 50 or higher. And then that way you at least know that you're getting the 30. And is, then there, you, mm-hmm. is there any downside to a 50 over a 30? I always wondered why people no. just didn't pick the highest number. Is there? No. So there's not a, really a downside to a higher number, mm-hmm. but what people need to understand is once you go past that 50, there's not really much more added value that they've shown. Okay. So basically, if you get that 50 area, you're good. Getting up to like 200 and so forth, you know, doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to have better coverage. Gotcha. And then you also want to buy one that's broad spectrum. There's different ultraviolet rays from the sun. So there's UVA and UVB. Think of UVA as, as A and aging. So that's where you get your sunspots and your wrinkles. And then UVB, think of that as your burn. And that's the one that's most likely to give you a sunburn. So you want to buy a sunblock that actually covers both, so broad spectrum. And then there is no such thing as waterproof. Um, they're water resistant. So pick one that's either water resistant, which means it lasts usually about 40 minutes or very water resistant, which can be up to 80 minutes. Um, And make sure that, again, it's water resistant. It's not waterproof. So if you're washing it off, if you're drying off a lot, if you've been in this water or in the sun for more than two hours, you need to make sure that you're reapplying it. And especially for children, you need to use one that's for children because um, they have more sensitive skin. So actually buy a product that says for, for kids, you know, or for babies. And stay away from the ones that have the chemical oxybenzone in them because it's been shown to possibly have some hormonal properties. Gotcha. Uh, What in the kid one is better for kids? Is it just to avoid rashes or irritation? That's the big thing, yeah, because a lot of kids have sensitive skin. Some people have eczema, um, and I can kind of cover younger babies too, um, but they do tend to have more sensitive skin. So you want to make sure that these products don't have extra perfumes, extra unnecessary chemicals. You don't want any tanning products in there. It's just that there's more and more added to the adult products. Um, Zinc oxide and titanium dioxide are other great ingredients that can help protect sensitive skin for babies, especially if they're having a hard time with different sunblocks that you're buying. So you can look for that. Um, And then a big thing that parents ask me with their young kids is, can I put sunblock on my baby? Right. And that's, I mean, that's a good question because you do want to be cautious. So sunblock is actually recommended or sunscreen is recommended for children six months and older. Um, And that's because babies under six months old have very sensitive and thinner skin than older children and adults do. So it may not provide enough protection for them. And they're also very little with big heads. (laughs) (laughs) So if you're putting something that has some chemicals in it, they're going to be absorbing more over their body surface area and that may not be good for them. So in general, you want to give them loose, breathable clothing with a tight weave, floppy hats, cover their feet. And if you're going to use sunscreen, only use it on their face, like their ears, their neck, and the top of their feet are areas that may not be covered by the clothing that you have them in. Yeah, I think a lot of people don't realize that clothing is one of your best forms of sunscreen. Absolutely. Yeah, right? absolutely. Long sleeves, pants, and they actually do sell products that are, um, so they have sunproof factor so oh, that cool. actually blocks the sun, the clothing that you can buy for babies. Um, but a big thing is when you buy those hats, make sure for babies or anyone, Get the floppy hats. Don't get the baseball caps because it's not going to cover your ears and your neck. And I've had athletes come in and tell me how they got burned because they weren't thinking and they thought it was enough. Perfect. So um, with the kid's sunscreen, so if it has less stuff in it, is the kid's sunscreen safe for adults? Does it go the other way around? Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, as someone who doesn't like putting extra stuff on me, the the baby sunscreen actually sounds more appealing than the adult sunscreen with all the extra junk in it, you know? 
Now there is another caveat. So Uh-oh. I don't know how you grew up, but you're from Uh-oh. over on the, the beach side too, but yeah. believe it or not, most people actually, so you can buy the right sunscreen, but you mm-hmm. have to put it on properly. And most people actually put on half to less than half of what's actually needed. Really? So you, yes. <laughs> so you have to actually put it on properly. And when we were growing up, I mean, you would see kids standing at the beach, like parking and spraying the, the sunscreen on or putting it on, on the beach. You're actually supposed to apply it 15 to 30 minutes before the sun exposure for it to actually absorb and be working properly. Okay. So you want to make sure that you're doing that. You want to make sure that you use an abundant amount. And when it comes to the sprays, it's really hard with the spray. People love them. I actually love them. But it's hard to tell if you put enough on because you don't really see it. So once you spray it on, you want to rub it in really well. And you don't want to spray it in the face because you don't want to breathe it in. Kids can get, you know, a reaction to that. It can cause problems in your lungs. But spray it on your hand and then rub it in and actually rub it in all of it. Gotcha. Yeah, I always think the spray the spray reminds me of um, shampoo that doesn't bubble. Like it doesn't feel like it's working, you know. <laughs> like I want to I see it lather up for it to work, right? You know? <laughs> right. See it to believe it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> You know, and I'm sure the shampoo is doing a fine job, but I just, you know, if it doesn't lather up, I'm like, nah, I don't, I don't trust it. Something's <laughs> right. <something> wrong. <laughs> something wrong with that stuff. Feel that way. <laughs> right. <laughs> so um, obviously, when someone gets sunburned, they turn red. Are they under the signs? And, and when someone does get sunburned, how do you treat them? Um, so typically, you can see red skin. Well, let me back up. Actually, so m- most of the time. Mm-hmm. Symptoms of sunburn usually show up hours later, okay. but you do want to, you know, keep your eye out, especially for those babies. Um, and then going back with a baby that's less than six months old, you don't want them in direct sun at all. You basically want them under a canopy in a tent, under a beach umbrella, because you want to limit their exposure as much, as much as possible and keep them hydrated. Um, but if you start seeing that the skin is very warm, it can be red, it can be painful, um, or with younger babies, if they start crying more, if they seem more irritable, those can all be signs that a sun um, burn is developing. Um, so what you want to do immediately is what people forget, remove yourself from the sun. <laughs> like, don't stay there. You know, come out of the sun, especially for the babies. And then you want to actually hydrate do people, well. Do people really forget that? Yeah, well, that will go in like into the shade, but you have to remember okay. that the shade is actually still exposing you to the sun. And right. then also remember that the um, sand, the water, concrete, all those things reflect the sun's rays. So it's actually still bouncing towards you, especially if you're poolside and you don't always realize it. Gotcha. That little guest jumping in on the screen with us. Oh. <laughs> That's Brody. What's your, what's Bro- oh, Brody. What kind of dog is Brody? Brody is a toy poodle. <laughs> Brody is adorable. How old is Brody? Brody is 10. So he's wow. actually been alive for longer than I, well, a little less than I've known you. <laughs> right. And you got Brody after we met. Um, exactly. Brody is cute. My, my girlfriend has got a, a toy uh, pit bull. And oh. he's like nine <laughs> weeks old. And oh, also he's a baby. Pitbull, but he's like a little puppy. That's that's amazing. Uh, that that is one of the cutest dogs I've ever seen. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Um, so for treatment of sunburn, so yeah. remove yourself from the sun mm-hmm. and then you actually want to apply cool compresses or cool running water, fresh water over the area to decrease the burning. And then and you actually want to try to hydrate because when you have the burn, your body starts losing its ability to retain the water. So cool water, cool compresses, and then actually moisturize with a gentle moisturizer to kind of help soothe the, the dryness um, and the pain that you're feeling. Um, you can also take pain medications um, for children six months and older and adults. You can do like an Advil or something like that or ibuprofen. This is a generic name, which is perfectly fine. And then for children under six months old, you would only want to use acetaminophen, which is Tylenol is one brand for that. Um, and then it's also recommended to stay away from products that actually have things like a cane, like an analgesic in it, pain reliever, um, just because there can be some concerns with that, especially for children. Why do you avoid ibuprofen until six months versus acetaminophen? It has to do with the development of baby's kidneys, actually. Um, okay. Their ability to regulate the water and salt level in their body, sodium level in their body. So they don't actually develop that ability well. And it's not complete ent- until after six months. You know, so you have to be cautious, which we can talk about some risk with swimming, actually, with that sure. for babies. Um, but the ibuprofen actually affects the arteries and the kidneys. So that's why you stay away from it. Okay. Yeah, because I always think of um, Tylenol or acetaminophen as um, 
you know, it's in his blood, you know, which ibuprofen for me has always been the safer one because I've been on blood thinners, you know, so it's weird to hear it the other way around. Or am I backwards? It's, it's, it's the opposite. Yeah. I'm backwards, right? I am. I knew it. <laughs> so, so what about the, the kidneys and the salt and the swimming? So, um, a lot of people talk about, you know, is swimming lessons recommended? And although in the last few years it's been recommended, well, it is okay to actually do swimming lessons for children's ages one to four, whereas before the American Academy of Pediatrics was against that. Now yeah. they say that it's based on the parent's, you know, choice, and then it's a child is developmentally appropriate, which you would ask the pediatrician about. We, we, but for we babies, used to, we used to argue mm-hmm. with them extensively because um, really? their age was well, under five, um, mm-hmm, exactly. and, and most kids who drown drown between one and four years old. Mm-hmm. So if you wait till five, most most of those kids have already died. Um, yeah. And, and, you know, we, we've seen videos and you, I'm sure, you know, of kids mm-hmm. um, successfully teaching themselves how to swim, you know, in a year or even six months. Um, mm-hmm. So. So, yeah, to deny a kid, you know, swimming lessons till at least five years old, five was late, um, you know, but uh, you, you, you know, you, you've taken a lot of risk for mm-hmm. a kid who, you know, might not make it to five. Um, yeah. but at the time, they were worried about ear infections. I think it was one of the main things. I was like, <laughs> I'd risk the ear infection. For, uh, I, but, I'm actually seeing that pretty much twice a day now because that's, yeah. that's the most common infection from swimming. <laughs> yeah. um, but I can kind of cover it based on age. So basically, as you said, it's pretty much always been recommended or recently been recommended for kids, you know, four and up mm-hmm. are fine to have swimming lessons. It's definitely recommended it can reduce the risk of drowning. It's not going to drown proof your child, but it will certainly help. Sure. And then they did find in some small studies, ages one to four, that it does actually show some reduction of the risk. Mm-hmm. So um, again, consult with your pediatrician or your kid doctor to make sure that your child is appropriate to take these lessons. Um, and then that would be recommended as well. But as far as formal swimming lessons, that's actually not recommended until the age of four just because a lot of kids under the age of four aren't developmentally ready to be able to hold their breath long enough for that formal swimming lesson. Okay. Certainly safety and things like that is fine. Now, when it comes to those babies that are infants that are under one years old, there are a few concerns. So one of the concerns is the water um, intoxication, which is what the sodium we were talking about, or I think some people call it water poisoning. Okay. So babies you know, they open their mouth a lot, they can swallow a lot of water. So when these babies are being submerged, which is not recommended under the age of one, um, they start swallowing water often, or they can get water into their face. And they're taking in <clears throat> larger amounts of water than usual. And this actually can drop that sodium level in the body, which can put a child at risk for seizures. Um, and even more severely, if they get a lot of it, you know, um, brain swelling. So that's one of the reasons it's not recommended. And then also babies under the age of one aren't as good at regulating their body temperature. So if they're in waters that are less than about, uh, I think it's like 85 degrees, then they actually can start um, dropping their body temperature and become hypothermic. Um, So that's a concern as well. And if you ever see a child that is shivering or their lips look a little bit blue, you immediately want to take them out of the water, dry them off, and then take a dry towel and wrap them up to try to warm them back up and, and monitor them closely. And then other gotcha. things can be infection. Right. So <laughs> if, you know, one of the other things, because I know that, you know, some people do start as early as six months old. So mm-hmm. what other signs that you'll be looking out for if they're, you know, in their eight month old, we'll say, um, in the middle of lessons to you know, know that there's something wrong? Um, so you look for the hypothermia, you know, and then you look for those symptoms, you know, of, of drowning, certainly, you know, so if they're swallowing a lot of water, um, you want to make sure that the child's not irritable, you know, that the child's not more tired, um, fussy. Typically with babies, they can be just irritable. They can't communicate to us well, as we talked about the six month olds, but if they're yeah. more irritable, they're fussy, maybe they don't want to eat. That can often be a sign that something is wrong when a child is skipping more than one feed, or if they're just more sleepy, lethargic than, than usual, then you probably want to take that child in to see the doctor um, just to make sure that everything's okay. And the other big reason I believe that it's actually not recommended under the age of one yet is because unlike that one to four year old population, and there haven't been any studies to show that it actually does reduce the risk of drowning. So, I mean, I think we've seen, all seen videos where we've seen the baby swimming under the water, and that's great. But the big question is, is it actually making a difference, you know, overall? And I think that they're going to look into that, certainly, because if it is, then wonderful. Um, but I think we have to always be cautious and, and do the studies. I love Brody back there just chilling, by the way. He is fantastic. <laughs> Glad he's, he's being quiet. Yeah. <laughs> He is super adorable. Um, so, <laughs> thank you. Um, and I, and you, you kind of touched on this, but it's, it's worth mentioning. You know, 
the the water safety community for a long time was rallying against the term near drowning because mm-hmm. drowning itself is a is a process, as you said, mm-hmm. and um, near drowning implies you know that you missed out on drowning. But if you had any kind of water related you know incident um, where you were you know unable to breathe underwater, exactly, and, you, know, mm-hmm. um, you you drown. Um, and I would say that drowning is like a heart attack. Um, either you survived or you didn't, but mm-hmm. you still had a heart attack, right? It, you don't exactly. call it a near heart attack when you, when you right. survived a heart attack. Exactly. Um, so you can have a fetal or non-fetal drowning, but it's mm-hmm. still drowning. Even if your kid survives yeah. and everything turns out fine, um, he's That's still right. technically drowned. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's right. I agree with you. Thank you. Um, I'm glad someone does. You know. <laughs> so um, let's talk about water safety in general. What do you tell your parents to come in? Well, especially for my more elementary school kids when they've actually learned to swim, a big thing about them is they learn to swim, they get excited and they become overly confident. (laughs) And they think now that they've learned how to swim, they've reached this milestone that they that's it. They're done. They're ready and they don't need any supervision. So I always tell parents and the kids, actually, because I I mentioned earlier, I love to talk to my kids. I'm like, you always swim with an adult, right? Yes. (laughs) And they agree they with you. Yeah. So they always have to be supervised by an adult. Um, swimming helps to reduce the risk of drowning, but it does not waterproof your child. So always having an adult present. Um, I also talk with them about having buddies because the much older children, like the teenagers, they think that, you know, they're okay. They'll go out to the beach with friends. They may go into the water, but they want to actually always have someone there with them. Um, and, and then also realizing that once you get into these other bodies of water, like lakes and ponds and the ocean, there are a whole other risk factors that come into play there that the ch- child is not going to be aware of or think about like rip tides and things like that or waves that are going to knock them down and disorient them. So they have to be a lot more careful in these different environments. And it's important for parents to sit down and talk to their kids about this. So, you know, what do parents um, freak out about or get scared about? Not just with the pool, but in general that they probably shouldn't be worrying about. Is there anything that parents come in about that are, uh, maybe a, a, a trend that's going on right now where people are nervous about something that is that really a big deal? No, no? <laughs> not that I'm aware of. Yeah. I think most parents um, are anxious about their toddlers. Sure. Um, I think, I think probably what it is is that they're so there's so, most of the parents that I see are very focused on swimming um, and, and swim safety, which I'm happy about. Um, but I think sometimes they, they forget about the, other risk factors. I want to say, um, if I say this correctly, for the the younger infants closer to the age of one, you know, you think about swimming pool, the above ground pools, the in ground pools, but you forget about the little play pools that you put water in that maybe your dog or Brody or somebody is playing in. Yeah, that is just as much a risk for a child to drown. A young child, they can drown in like an inch or two of water. Mm-hmm. And I think parents forget sometimes when the baby's in the bathtub. You know that you always do touch supervision, which is where they're always within arm's length that you still have to translate that to the swimming pool, to little wading pools and all those different things because babies in that younger age group die from drowning in buckets um, and, and bathtubs uh, and standing water like that. And you may not think about that when you're so focused on the pool, that's, you know, that big body of water. Um, so just reminding them that water is not only there, there's water in the ditches, especially here in Florida. Um, there's water, you know, and different like, um, tire swings or if you have tires outside the the bird baths just different areas and that also brings the risk of mosquitoes too which we're all familiar with and florida unfortunately it is the official state bird of florida the mosquito <laughs> yeah pretty much <laughs> <laughs> i used to camp on an island they called it mosquito island <laughs> that sounds like a terrible idea why would you go there <laughs> i love camping <laughs> you really i, I hate oh, yeah. camping I, i'm an, i'm an indoorsy person i i do not camp <laughs> My idea of oh, camping is like four season <laughs> hotel room. Yeah. Well, one thing about camp, well, not camping, but um, insects and sunscreen is actually, they do sell combination sunscreen and insect repellent. Oh, cool. Which, you know, in thought is a great idea. However, sunscreen, as we talked about, you reapply it every two hours. Right. You don't reapply s- insect repellent every two hours. So it's usually okay. recommended to get one and the other one and apply them, apply them separately. Right. You don't want to overdose on insect repellent, right? Exactly. And another common thing people ask is, is insect repellent okay for children? And it is actually okay to use deep containing products um, 
down to like two months and up. You know, you want to use appropriate levels, standard levels, not like those huntsman levels where you're hunting, things like that. But usually a 10 to 30 percent is okay. So besides drowning and Mm -hmm. sunburn, what other things should parents be looking out for, you know, outside by the pool, et cetera? Well, there's definitely mosquitoes like we talked about. Make sure that you have something appropriate in place because there are mosquito borne infections. Um, You want to think about stinging insects such as bees, um, especially around like ponds and lakes. Bees love bright colors. If you have on a beautiful floral print, it's very cute, but the bees don't understand. (laughs) They think it's there for them. Um, And if you're using fragrance products, they may be more attracted to you. So be careful with that. And then if you do get stung, you know, take care of it. And then you want to remove the stinger with like a a credit card or something or your nail to to bring it out of the skin. Um, Some less common things. Well, swimmers here, let's back up to swimmers ears. So you mentioned that earlier. That's probably the most common thing that I see and parents ask all the time, what can I do to prevent swimmers ear? Well, really, the biggest thing that you can do is right there after the swim is actually get the water out of the ear. So basically take a towel or a clean rag or even maybe like a little cotton and tip the head to the side. And just try to shake the ear and get as much water out as possible so the ear is as dry as possible. And that will greatly reduce the risk of infection. There's drops and things like that, but that's the biggest thing that you can actually do. Okay. Um, Go ahead. No, go ahead. Finish. Um, Some less common things that you can see is going to be around bodies of fresh water, which is something that you see maybe in lakes or at the ocean, is something called cutaneous larva migrants, which okay. is actually an infection of a parasite that can actually come in through your foot. And actually, I think we treated a kiddo with this not that long ago. Um, so basically, when you're walking around at the beach in different areas, if you don't have on swim shoes or swim socks, these little hookworms can actually, um, as I know, attach. This is terrifying. <laughs> and actually, <laughs> it's okay. Um, but it happens. It's, it's not the most common thing, but we do yeah. see it here and there. Um, and what happens is, is, you know, this is why I don't walk this right here. Yeah. This is the exact reason why I don't walk. Yeah, I I could. And I'm like, no, this weird hookworm thing is terrifying. Yeah, And I'm just going to be in a wheelchair all the time because that is way safer than putting my feet on the ground. That that is terrible. Well, you're going to love this. So you can tell there's an infection. Right. Oh, God. Usually when you start seeing like a snake-like pattern um, where it's actually, you know, in the skin and it's like reddish pink. And that's typically the, the telltale sign that you, you probably have an infection with this. And the good news is it's actually treatable. Um, and it actually so. is self-limited <laughs> because humans are not natural hosts for this um, parasite. So eventually it will die, but we can't actually treat it. Um, and another thing I want to touch on, which scares people to death, but is more very... More than the crazy hookworm thing? Even more than that. You hear okay. about it in the news regularly. Yeah. You may know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Is um, I, I never pronounce it properly. Nagleria fowleri, which is an amoeba. So it's actually an amoeba that usually around this time of year, you hear about it in the news, um, Mm -hmm. which is people are afraid that it's going to go into your nose and infect your brain and cause, you know, death. Okay. Um, And actually it it, it is possible to to die from this infection, but the infection itself is exceedingly (laughs) rare. I mean, there's probably like a case or two or less a year. You know, so it's very uncommon, but it basically is an amoeba that lives in fresh, warm water. So like your hot springs here in Florida, you know, your, your lakes, your, your rivers that are fresh water. And basically, if you have a forceful amount of water going into the, the nose, like if you're diving in or jumping in or something like that, the water can get up into your sinuses and then actually it migrates from there, the amoeba, into the brain and it can make you very sick. Um, it usually, usually it's fatal, but again, people get worried about it. They worry about swimming. It's very unlikely that your child's going to have this issue. Because, again, it's like one or so cases a year. Gotcha. You know, when I think of uh, things I worry about <clears> in the brain, I'm, I'm worried about cats. Um, the, the toxoplasma, is, is that the right? Am I saying uh, it right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That, that scares me more than the amoeba about things getting my brain. <laughs> is the, uh, the, the evil cat um, brain control parasite. <laughs> that, that's awful. Yeah. Do kids, by the way, do kids have to worry about that? Is that do you, you do have yeah. to be concerned about it. Yeah. Um, but not overly concerned. You know, a, a lot of we always I always caution parents, have fun, you know, live your life. Don't don't be afraid of what may happen. Just be vigilant. And if something seems wrong, you know, go see your doctor, call the doctor. You know, we're on call. We encourage parents to call because we never want them to not call because they felt like they were bothering us. So live your life. 
follow the safety recommendations that we're giving them. And then if you have a concern, you know, call us. You can't prevent everything from happening, but you can do your best by following the recommendations. For, for anyone who doesn't know, can you explain that, the Toxoplasma? Well, I mean, as best you can. I don't want to go too much off subject. Um, yeah. It is something that we worry about. I mean, actually, what we worry about most with cats is actually cat scratch disease, which is an infection where you get a fever and a swollen lymph node. We'll that talk about that then. I mean, that, that's, you know, because I, I try to do child safety in general, not just water yeah, safety. Yeah, yeah. So um, yeah. cat scratch is more, much far, far more common. Yeah, please. <clears throat> Although it's not go. that common. Yeah. But basically, um, it's a disease that you can get from being scratched by a cat. Um, it's not typically older cats. It's actually cats that are kittens um, and they may get a scratch here and there. And then suddenly, you know, a few days later or so, the child may start complaining of fever and a swollen lymph node. And it's often mistaken for possibly a strep infection or mono or something else that typically so wait, doesn't get better. There's actually a, a cat scratch fever. It's called cat scratch. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't know that was really a thing. That's why it's okay. Um, a cat. So um, usually kittens. So that's something that you always want to keep in the back of your mind, you know, discuss with your your kid's doctor when you go and see them, especially if the infection is not improving. Like if someone puts you on an antibiotic for strep infection and they're not getting better, typically cat scratch doesn't um, get cured with the typical antibiotics that we use most commonly for strep. So you would want to fall back up with your doctor and let them uh, let them know. And I actually had a kiddo with that, um, I think, last year. So it happens. Gotcha. Yeah, I, I thought the song, mm -mm, I thought it was just a song. I didn't realize it was actually a disease. It's, funny. it's a song? Yeah, it's a song, Cat Scratch Fever. Yeah. Did not know that. <laughs> That's why I'm asking if it's really a Cat Scratch Fever. Yeah, I, I forget who does it. Hopefully someone in the comments can tell me who does it because I'm terrible. But yeah, there's, there's a song, Cat Scratch Fever. So random. It's, I think it's like an 80s song. You, you'll look it up now that I said it. It, it would be an 80s song. <laughs> yeah. I picture like a hair band, you know. Um, Cat Scratch Fever. Yeah, I forget who sings it. <laughs> Hopefully someone tells me I have to look it up. Uh, so what about in-home child safety stuff? Um, child proofing, baby proofing. Uh, what do you recommend for parents as far as that? Well, sticking with the um, idea of water safety, a big thing for babies, especially when they start walking, is they're very curious. And actually, toilets is a major risk in homes. Um, so I always talk with parents about closing the toilet seat down right. and actually closing the bathroom door because kids just love water. They want to splash in it. You know, they know things that go down. <laughs> Yes. So they want to see what they can put in there and they'll lose their balance and babies in general have bigger heads. So once they fall in, they have a really hard time getting out because their head is so top heavy um, and babies can drown in toilets. So that's a big one. I'm um, still, I'm still top heavy. I still have a giant head. So I'm working on it. But. <laughs> no, you don't. <laughs> And then, um, you know, stair safety. So if you have any stairs in your home, um, you want to make sure that you're using the baby gates or baby gates for any dangerous area <clears throat> in your home and that you want to make sure that you're always um, keeping them closed. You know, that even goes back to pool safety. I know we're talking about indoors, but with those pool safety fences that are definitely recommended completely separate from the home and circling the pool, mm -hmm. you want to make sure that it's self-closing if possible and that the latch is high and that it's not climbable. I mean, we've all seen these YouTube videos, Facebook videos of babies climbing out of cribs and everything else. It's possible. If they, where there's a will, there's a way, right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Kids are creative <laughs> and they're fast, you know. <laughs> yes. It's their job to figure it out. Um, it so make sure that they don't have anything that they can grasp onto and, and, and crawl over and that the slats are close enough so that they can't get through them. Mm -hmm. um, those are the two main things. And then also as children get older, actually are like 18 month olds, children about that age, they will start trying to climb out of those cribs and there's cute videos about it. But usually, you know, there's a fall involved and you want to avoid like head trauma and things like that. So if your child is getting to the age where they're showing you that they can climb or they're trying to climb out of the bed, put them into a toddler bed where they're safer. So what accidents do you see the most from inside the house? Um, not drowning, what related probably, necessarily, unless it is, but. I would say probably falls, okay. you know, kids climbing onto chairs, climb. I mean, kids are climbers, you know, they'll right. try to climb up the pantry. Oh my goodness. That's my niece when she wants something. <laughs> <laughs> they'll climb pantries, they'll climb the cabinets. Um, or usually just the younger children that don't have their balance down very well yet, they'll fall. Um, or kids falling off their bicycles, things like that. And actually a, a thing that unfortunately can happen is, when babies are in car seats and someone actually bumps the car seat and the baby's not strapped in, the baby can fall out. Oh. Or if the car seat flips over and the baby's not secured inside, then the car seat flips, hits the ground, and the baby comes out and then hits the ground as well. So I always recommend to my parents, 
always make sure that you buckle the seatbelt, no matter how short of a time they're going to be in the carrier or in the stroller, because they can fall out if anything happens, if they bump something, you go over a curb. And speaking of car seats, I saw a story um, two days ago Mm -hmm. of um, another child who passed away in the back of a car Mm -hmm. uh, from pediatric vehicular heat stroke, um, Mm -hmm. which is is terrible, obviously. It is terrible. And... And I'm not sure, um, you know, beyond some kind of change to vehicles, you know, mm-hmm. I mean, I guess we have the uh, the bag in the back idea, right? Where people um, say to leave their purse kind of in the back seat as a reminder. Sure. Yeah. So people recommend leaving like a stuffed animal and then moving it right. to the front seat when the baby's in there. There's lots of different sure. yeah. approaches people are looking at, yeah. but it's always so sad. It is. Um, yeah. I, think, I think I told you I've been advocating the, the, the three R's, uh, which is um, remind the parent um, uh, technology, a standard inside the car that, uh, rolls down the windows. If the, if the child is left in there and, oh. um, is to reverse the temperature by rolling down the windows wow. and then setting the car alarm off to rescue the child. Uh, oh, that's I, great. yeah, I like the, the three R's I'm trying to try to get that out there. That's excellent. Um, Good luck with that. Thank you. Uh, absolutely. Well, now, you, you know, you brought up cars and car seats, so I have to yes. talk about car seat safety. Please do. <laughs> So um, two things that I often see parents are confused about or hear old guidelines on Mm -hmm. is when to turn the child around in the car. So there was a previous guideline that said that children can face forward when they're one years old and about 20 pounds. That's no longer the recommendation. It's actually recommended for the child to remain backwards facing until the age of two. Oh, yeah. And a lot of parents are like, oh, but they're so tall. Like my nieces, they're so tall. Their father is tall <clears throat> and they worry about the legs. They're like, they're crisscrossing. And I tell parents, well, yeah, your legs, your knees are meant to bend, you know, so crisscrossing of the legs is fine, but whiplash is not natural. So you do want to have them rear facing longer so that they can be more safe in their developmental level in the car and then turn them around. Because if you turn them around before two years old, it's really, really hard and going to be a task to get them to turn back around. So gotcha. it's best just to keep them backwards facing. Why did they make that change? Just because they found developmentally, you know, when it came to car accidents, babies were not able to tolerate the whiplash that occurred um, in vehicles during accidents. So it's better to have them rear facing. And then for older kids, a big thing that we see is kids wanting to come out of a car seat into a booster seat and then actually even out of the booster. So typically um, a rough guideline is about four years old and 40 pounds is when a time is a time when you can start looking at booster seats, but you have to actually check the, the booster seat that you bought and make sure it's um, appropriate for your child's age and, and weight and everything else on it. Um, and then the kids that want to come out of the booster seats, I see a lot of kids that are six years old, um, maybe even five years old sometimes or seven years old that come out and the best thing to do is to keep them in there and ask the doctor before taking them out, because once you've taken them out, they get upset. They are social concerns. My friend's not in a booster. I don't want to be in a booster. I'm embarrassed. Um, but that recommendation actually is to be eight years old, 80 pounds and four foot nine before you come out of that booster seat. Wow. So where you can actually be safe riding in a car with just a seatbelt on. And there's some other things that you can look at in the car to make sure that it's fitting appropriately. But typically if you don't meet all three of those, you're probably not as safe in, a, in an accident. I would have been 17, I think, before I got out of mine. <laughs> <laughs> well, at least you can ride in the front seat. The front seat is 13 and up and oh, the weight okay. on the airbag. That's yeah. it. I'll be right then. Um, <laughs> I break a lot of hearts in the office. <laughs> like, sorry. So sad. <laughs> so, so what's something that um, parents don't do that you wish they did or the other way around that they, they do that you wish they didn't? Oh, give me a, an area. Um, in, uh, I would say like in-home child safety, you know. Um, I guess one thing is being cautious about, um, what do you call it? Walkers. So okay. baby, so a lot of people enjoy walkers for their, their children, but mm-hmm. walkers can actually be dangerous, especially if you have an area in your home where you go from a soft surface to like a hard surface, mm-hmm. because that if the child is moving very quickly, which a lot of kids, toddlers, they get very excited. They can actually be on the hardwood floor and be going at a pretty good speed. And when they hit that area where it meets the carpet, it may actually flip the, um, the walker over. So making sure that they're cautious about that and maybe just not using the walker at all, just using something like a, a extra saucer where it's just a stationary play area where the child can turn and, and stand and, and sit down when they want to. That's probably a big one just to prevent injuries at home. 
And then um, one thing I would want all parents to do is actually keep the number for poison control in their home and in their phone or on their fridge. I actually recommend for when babysitters are there. Um, a lot of things in the home are, you know, poisonous. You know, it could be a pill that you drop that's under the, the counter that you, you didn't see. But trust me, a, a one year old will find it. Or it could just even be houseplants because many, many houseplants are actually poisonous. And if you've ever seen a young child, everything goes straight in the mouth. And they can ingest that. And you don't know, do I need to go to the doctor? Do I need to go to the ER? If you call poison control, if the child's stable, they usually can answer that question for you. Gotcha. What kind of houseplants do people look out for? I wish I knew that. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a list. <laughs> and I do not have a green thumb. All my plants are outside and they barely make it. <laughs> But yeah. I'm sure if you, you look online, you can probably yeah. find that information. <laughs> Google has a comprehensive list of all yes. the plants, I'm sure, you know. <laughs> um, is there anything else that you, you want parents to know that's, that's important that you feel like isn't getting out there enough or um, in general on anything? Any, any pet peeve? Or? A pet peeve. I wouldn't say any pet peeves. What I would just say is in general, when you ask your doctor a question, your kid doctor, you're not bothering us. I mean, sometimes you may feel bad or you may feel guilty or someone else may make you feel guilty or you feel like maybe you're calling or coming to the office too much. We would much rather that you ask us than to do mm -hmm. something you're not comfortable with. And we would also much rather that you ask us instead of limiting what you and your family can do. So I would just want parents to know that if you're concerned, if you're worried, if you have any questions at all, we are here for you. We want to hear from you and we want to make sure that you and your children and your family are living a healthy, happy, low stress life as much as possible. So we're here for you and, and we want to help. So Perfect. don't forget that and don't worry. Don't worry in general. Yes, don't worry. Follow don't safety worry. guidelines. Ask the doctor, not Dr. Google. <laughs> Maybe uh, that's a pet peeve. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> Most people that actually come in and tell me they Googled something regret it and they, now they think that they're dying. <laughs> right. So don't Google it. <laughs> Call the office. Talk with us. Talk with one of the nurses. They're usually pretty great and experienced. And we're happy, we're happy to guide you and answer those questions. I saw a cartoon in my doctor's office that said uh, patients who looked up their diagnosis online uh, pay double. Yeah. <laughs> pay double? Okay, that was good. Yeah. Maybe in stress and anxiety. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Usually it's something that's easily treatable and everyone thinks that they're, you know, going to, you know, have a yeah. bad outcome. Yeah, but. yeah. We, all, we all have some rare strain of Ebola and, uh, you know. It's coming for sure. Um, and then for me personally, you know, I'm, I'm going to be giving a lot more health tips um, online. So for people that are interested in finding out more about who I am, getting more information on more specific health topics at home, you know, safety and other things. I am actually on social media so they can follow me at facebook.com forward slash Dr. Andrea MD. That's D-R-A-N-D-R-E-A-M-D. -E um, and I'm happy to answer questions that maybe people have about the podcast today that we didn't cover. Awesome. Um, do you have any questions for me? I don't. I'm just glad that you're doing this. I'm so thankful that you had me on today to get to talk and, and educate families and just catch up with an old friend after 10 or more years. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and one thing I haven't done before, but I might start doing, you're going to be the guinea pig. Um, mm -hmm. Is there anything that you would, any question uh, that you would like to ask the audience that you'd like to see them answer in the comments? Um, on anything, any, any kind of general polling thing you could ask, you know, the 10 to 20,000 or so people that end up watching this each time um, that they can answer for you in the comments. I would just say, what are some topics that you guys want to hear more about? Or what are mm -hmm. some um, things that you feel like you wish you had known before, you know, you went to the pediatrician, maybe when you were having a baby that no one covered for you, you know, if I had known this, things would have been easier. So anything like that. Or just questions in general, because if one person has a question, there's probably about 500 other people that have the same question. But but I like that, you know, was something uh, what's something that you you wish um, you knew before you went to the doctor um, that you didn't know? That's a good one. I think a big thing, maybe not so much that I wish I knew, but a lot of people get embarrassed about certain health conditions. You know, okay. maybe if it's um, <laughs> you know, in a more private area and they sure. worry, oh, the doctor's going to judge me. They're going to, you know, think different things about me. That is not at all true. 
We right. are not at all concerned about people's private lives and what's going on. We just want to make sure that you're healthy. So never, ever, ever be embarrassed about going to the doctor and asking about personal things, whether it's your mental health, whether it's something in a more private area of your life, more private area of your body. Um, and then as a patient, when, you, when you're a doctor that becomes a patient, it helps you to be more sensitive to these needs of your own patients. So just knowing that we are not going to judge you and we really do want to know about all of your concerns. Perfect. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. You're welcome. This is, this is a lot of fun. It was great. Yeah. Um, I, I might try and rope you into doing like a and a Q&A for people one day. I think that might be a good idea. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Thank Perfect. you. I hope you have a happy fourth, a safe yes. and happy fourth uh, <laughs> with lots I hope, of sunscreen. <laughs> I, I hope you don't see anybody that loses any fingers or toes from fireworks. I hope not. I hope not. Just don't do it. Just go watch a show. Do you, do you see a lot of fireworks injuries? I don't actually. They probably no? end up in the ER, to be honest. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Good, yeah, good for you. Burns. They're good dangerous. Good. Burns, blindness, all kinds of things can happen. So yeah, I, I've always been I've never been a fan of up close fireworks. You know. Yeah, even sparklers can be dangerous. So sparklers scare me the most. Yeah. You know, I mean, fireworks on the ground are fine, but holding it in my hand, I don't know. Mm -hmm. I've never been a fan of sparklers. <laughs> yeah. Uh, spicy food. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just scared in general. I'm just, I'm just a, a boring, sad person. All right. <laughs> no. Right. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Have a good one. And we will talk to you soon. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Right. Bye, everyone.